The Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, this year celebrating their 250th anniversary, are best known as the favourite picnic spot to the west of London. Famous for the pagoda and the iconic palm house. And also famous, of course, for their stupendous collection of plants of all different shapes and sizes. I wanted to do some digging around, to hunt to the archives and do a little detective work to see what lies behind these lawns and immaculate flower beds. 2,000 plants are discovered every year still. In, in these... And what I found was not altogether what you might expect. Oh, my goodness, here, look at this. It's a story of passion, politics, and bloody battles that made this garden central to a struggle for world domination. You might never see Q in quite the same way again. For an historian, Q is a gold mine, not just a collection of plants. Q also has an extraordinary archive. This is a herbal that dates from 1633, um, a general history of plants, a wonderful document. And here are letters from Charles Darwin, written, uh, this one, when he was aboard the Beagle, dated 1833. It is signed down there, Charles Darwin. And a wonderful collection of photographs and prints. This one is sensational. It's a very early photograph showing the palm house under construction must date from the um, late 1840s. Not a hotbed of political intrigue at first glance. No obvious signs of a battle for world domination. But I'm intrigued by a line written by William Thistleton Dyer, a former director of the gardens. He wrote, we at Kew feel the weight of empire more than they do in Downing Street. Quite a claim, the weight, the might, the fate of empire resting here at Kew. I've arranged to meet Carolyn Fry, an author and journalist. She's been doing some of her own research into Q's mysterious links with empire. So was Thistleton Dyer overstating the case? Not at all. Towards the end of the 19th century, Q was acting as a hub corresponding with some 30 or so gardens around the world with the idea that they would support the British Empire by growing plants that could be of economic value uh, in the places where the climate was most suitable. Tell me about the scale of the operation. Well, the scale was immense. I mean, if you think that when the British Empire was at its greatest extent, it was holding sway over a quarter of the world's population. So Kew's operation was immense. At the beginning of the 19th century, much of the world was untouched and its plants unknown. By the end of the 19th century, it had been pretty well ransacked. So the people at Kew must have worked very closely with government. This was like a power base, really. Yes, very much so. It was very much at the heart of empire. So its directors were in the heart of government, really, and able to offer advice on plants, and so we're really in the thick of things. I think this is fascinating. Kew, a place of picnics and day trips, turns out to have been a world of big money and high politics. I want to know how Kew came to be tied up with government and empire to discover how these gardens came to have the expertise, the technology and the sheer imagination to pull off projects that influenced the lives of millions of people all over the world. This is going to require some digging into the earliest days of the garden, right back into the origin of Kew. The fields that reached down to the Thames had been laid out as gardens since the 17th century. But it was not until 1759, 250 years ago, 
that Kew began to emerge as an international collection. When Princess Augusta aspired to create a garden containing all the plants known on Earth. There's not much left today that Princess Augusta would recognise. A few follies such as a pagoda and this wonderful building behind me, built in the early 17th century, now known as Kew Palace. Although all has changed tremendously, the gardens were still very impressive. One contemporary writer described it as the paradise of our world, where all plants are found that money or interest can procure. There are a few slender links with Augusta's garden. This tree is one of them. There are in fact five ancient trees in Kew. They're now called the old lions. This particular wonderful Nile specimen is a black locust planted for Princess Augusta in 1762. The garden was not just a royal collection. It was also a playground for Augusta's children, including the prince destined to be King George III. It's tempting to think of the young George sitting here beneath his actual tree, contemplating the world, or indeed recovering here from one of those bouts of mental illness that haunted his later life. When George inherited the garden, he wanted to turn it into a bold statement. A symbol of his power and influence. He wanted plants displayed from the farthest reaches of his empire. On the 12th of July 1771, HMS Endeavour arrived back from a three year voyage of exploration around the world. Tales of Captain Cook's adventures swept through London. On the journey with Cook, was a young man, a botanist, called Joseph Banks. The king, always intrigued by new botanical discoveries, summoned Banks to Kew. The young man turned out to be a very able and enthusiastic a scientist, but more to the point, a very good storyteller. Indeed, so impressed was the king with the young botanist that he invited Banks to take charge of the royal garden. was perhaps the most significant appointment in the history of Kew Gardens. Joseph Banks was a man who knew how to use his powerful connections to make things happen. In later life, he was to become the longest serving president of the Royal Society. It's here that I've come to meet Neil Chambers. How nice to meet you. Welcome. Thank you. The man who knows Banks better than anyone alive having spent the last eight years editing over 4,000 of his letters. What sort of man was Joseph Banks? Uh, he was wealthy, a member of the landed elite, um, but also, I think, a very determined man. But I suppose he was someone who would say is not what you know, is who you know. Yes, uh, Banks is a, a great fixer. He's an organiser. Um, and uh, he organises people and projects in much the way he organised and arranged plants, really. Um, this is very much a strong part of his character. Uh, so you have to see Banks making connections between the king, uh, who was his great patron at Kew, uh, and also between government ministers and others um, with whom he, he meets and he sells the idea of science being useful. Uh, to the business of empire. And the thing to remember here is that there is no civil service at this stage, no part of it that would concentrate on exploration, voyages and discovery. So in the absence of people like that, Banks as a private individual steps in and fulfills that role. 
Before banks, the random acquisition of exotic plants in Kew's collection had come as gifts from other botanic gardens or brought home by travellers on state business. Banks was to usher in a new era. Plant hunters sponsored by the king. The first full-time hunter in Kew's history was Francis Masson. And here it is, one of Masson's discoveries from his first journey to the Cape of Good Hope. It's called Encephalatus altensteinii. And this isn't a descendant of the plant. This is the actual plant itself. Incredible. It's well over 200 years old now known as the uh, oldest pot plant in the world. This plant was growing when the Declaration of Independence was signed. This plant older than the United States of America. And um, this old chap keeps a secret. Europe in the 18th century was riven with duplicity, mistrust and deceit as nations competed to expand their empires. When Francis Masson was on the Cape collecting plants, it was natural that he would learn about the people and the geography he encountered. This information would later prove most interesting to the British government when it came to seize the Cape Colony from the Dutch. It was in this fierce heat of intense international rivalry that Banks put an idea to the king. He wanted to move an entire species halfway around the world. It was a proposal that was complex, difficult, and many thought doomed to failure. Banks's plan was revolutionary. I've come to Brixton Market in South London in search of the unlikely plant that inspired such an extraordinary scheme. Hello. Do you have um, any bread food? Yeah, I have bread food over here. Over here? Yeah. You have this. plain bread food, please? Good heavens. That's bread food. This is bread food. So um, how much is it? It's 149 a pound. And a weight, I suppose. 149 a pound. That's quite some. That's four pound ten pence, sir. Oh, it's quite quite expensive. Gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it tastes good, if it had. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> four pounds ten. Oh, Joseph Banks had first encountered breadfruit on the Endeavour voyage to the tiny Pacific island of Tahiti. There he'd seen whole families living from the fruit of a single tree. Hello. Hello, sir. My, I've been told you can cook my uh, breadfruit for me. Oh, your breadfruit? Sure, I can cook your breadfruit. Can do it. Yes, definitely. Wonderful. I mean, how, how do you cook it? Do you bake it, boil it? Breadfruit like this is just good for, for, for roasting, actually. The traditional way is to do it on a wood fire, but put it in the oven. It's just it's good to go, just like that. Okay. okay? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. I need it for the now. In the 18th century, the British islands in the West Indies were crucial to the empire, growing valuable sugarcane for export.
It was an economy dependent on slavery. But following American independence, the slave owners had a problem. The supply of American wheat to make bread to feed their slaves faltered, and as a result, the West Indies sugar trade was threatened with collapse. Banks suggested the crisis could be solved by replacing bread with a plentiful supply of bread fruit, translocated over 10,000 miles from Tahiti to the West Indies. Is it ready? Yes, 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 the red fruit is ready. I've, I've never had one before, you see, yeah. so it's all very exciting. Definitely like this, Dan. I mean, do you tend to eat it just by itself? Yeah, or, you can or? eat by itself with a bit of salt. And maybe butter or something? Yes, salt, pepper, butter. So uh, this is my first taste of this historic dish. Oh, it's very chewy. I mean, I like it. The consistency, very, very sort of dense. The subtle taste, subtle taste, very interesting. Hmm. It's really good. It's another bit, you think? Yeah. One could only imagine what the king made of a scheme to move a fruit he'd never heard of, from an island he'd never seen, to a country he could scarcely imagine. But this king liked to challenge. Thank you. Thank you. On the 23rd of December, 1787, Captain William Bly set sail on HMS Bounty for Tahiti. It was to become one of the most famous voyages ever to take place on the high seas. Banks had planned everything in meticulous detail. He rethought the design of the Bounty, reasoning that the young breadfruit plants would need maximum exposure to light and minimum exposure to salt water. There was only one place on the ship that would do. The great cabin with its long windows, normally the private quarters of the captain. These drawings of the bounty are fascinating. They show that the great cabin was extended, so it occupied virtually a third of the length of the ship, so it could accommodate the maximum number of breadfruit. This was good for the mission, allowing the bounty to carry the maximum number of pots of breadfruit, but not good for the captain, not good for his comfort, not good for his authority. He had to mess in with the crew. This, of course, was a recipe for disaster. The journey took 10 months, reaching Tahiti on the 26th of October, 1788. Five months later, 1,015 potted specimens were ready to be loaded onto the bounty for the journey to the West Indies. Anyone who spent time in a tropical paradise will be familiar with a little voice saying, what if I never went back? Well, for Bly's men, Five months in paradise convinced them they didn't want to return to the disciplined life of the Royal Navy. They got used to Tahitian ways, to Tahitian women. And one man, the master's mate and acting lieutenant, had married an islander. His name was Fletcher Christian. Leaving Tahiti for the open sea was, for Blythe's crew, like leaving paradise for hell. After just three weeks at sea, on the 28th of April, 1789, Captain Bly awoke at first light to discover the worst. The mutiny on the bounty had begun. Some of the crew, led by Fletcher Christian, had taken control of the ship. Captain Bly was abandoned in the middle of the Pacific and was left with a handful of men to take his chances, navigating 4,000 miles of ocean back to safety. Banks had staked his reputation on Bly's expedition, so when he heard of the mutiny, he was not about to admit defeat. A 
A year later, exonerated by a court-martial, Bly repeated the expedition with a new ship, again masterminded by Banks. And this time everything went to plan. Over 600 breadfruit trees were delivered to the slave owners of St. Vincent and Jamaica. What's more, Bly had filled the ship for the return voyage, and back in Britain presented Banks with the biggest collection of new species Q had ever received. Ah, oh, here it is, buried in the Q record book, a list of plants brought home in HMS Providence by Captain Bly in 1793. There are well over a thousand plants listed, including many plants not seen in Britain before. There are yam, bananas, a mango, and here, right at the top, listed under plants gathered in a Tahiti, a breadfruit. Four plants. This, of course, was an acquisition that was to make history at Kew. Now it seems there was to be no limit to the boldness of Banks' ambition. He imagined that breadfruit was only the start. Kew could, he argued, become a great botanical exchange house for the empire. It could collect seeds and plants from wherever they were growing, nurture them, and transfer them to wherever they were needed in the interests of empire. Key to Banks' plan was the establishment of satellite gardens throughout the British territories, receiving and looking after these new plants as necessary. Banks was always keen to promote and encourage the development of new gardens and in 1786 played an instrumental role in the creation of what's been described as the greatest of all colonial botanical gardens. Calcutta, now known as Kolkata, India. Today, Calcutta is the second largest city in India. Bustling, vibrant and colourful. <laughs> but everywhere you look, there are reminders of its colonial past. In the 1780s, Calcutta was under the rule of the British East India Company and was an increasingly important part of the British Empire. When a botanic garden was proposed for Calcutta, the company turned to Banks for guidance. He gave the project his wholehearted support, giving advice on what might be grown there. And they planted these. This is a mahogany tree. And these were brought here from the Honduras in 1793. Though I must say the oldest tree now is about a hundred years old. This is very valuable wood, this mahogany. Very important for the cabinet making industry. And these trees were taken throughout India and grown. And the wood used throughout the British Empire. At uh, this period, the gardens were becoming very important as an experimental centre with plants being brought from throughout the tropics and here they were tested and developed and utilised for their commercial potential. Today the garden is popular with walkers and those just happy to watch the world go by. But you don't have to look far to find the ghosts of empire. This old building was constructed to store plant records from right across the subcontinent in the heyday of the Botanic Garden. This is sensational here, so evocative and amazing. It's a wonderful piece of Victorian fireproof construction. Iron and brick arches and wonderful here. These cabinets for displaying, well, specimens of plants, books, paintings, 
all objects related to the collection. This really is one of the most striking 19th century interiors I've ever seen. Cast iron, beautiful decorated galleries, columns and a spiral staircase. And here are objects abandoned. There's the letters and books and uh, my goodness here, look at this fantastic 19th century publication showing different plants devoured by insects, damp through the monsoons, glass, photographs, negatives. I'll have a look, but um, it does seem to me that the weather has destroyed these. The chemicals have melted. Now, let's see, oh dear. It's very hard to see what this image shows. A landscape, trees, a view in Bengal, somewhere maybe the botanic gardens. What this does tell me, this building, of course, is that um, I mean, state-of-the-art construction, beautifully detailed, beautifully built, it does really confirm just how important the Calcutta Botanic Gardens were. By the end of Banks's life, she was central to an imperial network of gardens. It was the principal advisor to king and government on all matters botanical and was firmly in control of botanical activities throughout the British Empire. But suddenly, in 1820, Kew suffered a double loss that was to put its very future in jeopardy. At the end of January, King George III, Kew's great patron, died. In less than six months, Banks, Q's great visionary was dead too. For the first time in nearly half a century, Q had neither purpose nor direction. Many of Banks' scientific principles were abandoned and the gardens fell into disrepair. In 1837, the government put the royal finances under scrutiny and the gardens at Kew were seen as one area where costs might be cut. With Kew in decline, some proposed the gardens should close. A report was commissioned from Dr John Lindley of the Royal Horticultural Society. This is what Lindley wrote, and he was very bold indeed. If the botanical garden at Kew is relinquished by the Queen, it should either be at once taken for public purposes or it should be abandoned. Lindley was clear on what Kew's public purposes should be if it were to survive. It needed to explore and exploit all the ways the plants of the world might benefit the people of Britain and her dependencies by orchestrating a never-ending flow of plants that would best serve the Empire's economy. It was a formal acknowledgement of Banks' vision that would underpin the thinking of the next three directors of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew. Perhaps the greatest impact of the report was the appointment of William Hooker as Kew's first official director. Hooker, a botanist and a collector, would transform Kew. Hooker launched two of the most ambitious building projects in the history of Kew, the herbarium, and this, the palm house. Now the curious public had a magnificent temple to plants, the closest many Victorians would ever get to a rainforest. This is one of the most exciting, pioneering and important buildings of Victorian Britain. It exactly captures the spirit of the age. The design is also fit for its purpose. It allowed its inmates, exotic plants, to grow and flourish and look spectacular. 
If the palm house was how Hooker publicly displayed the flow of plants from around the world, then the herbarium was how he privately turned that flow back into a world-class scientific resource. Catch for plants, but this is what 18th century sort of garden history. Dr. David Mabberley is the latest in a long line of esteemed keepers of a Kew herbarium. So, um, what is an herbarium exactly? Well, it's a, a kind of library of plant specimens, specimens which have been collected from all over the world. Um, they're collected, dried, mounted on oh. cards, just like these here. For example, here's oh. one which was collected by no less a person than Charles Darwin. Good heavens! In the, in the Galapagos. And as you can see, they last in perfect conditions for a very long time. Some of them have survived for up to 500 years. Darwin's, of course, were collected in 1835 no, in the Galapagos. Absolutely amazing. Are you still receiving specimens? Oh, yes, good heavens. Um, we are still getting material in from all over the place because we are a collection which is worldwide. We have something over 7 million specimens. And good because heavens. of um, uh, increasing uh, collections, we are actually building a new wing here at Kew. This fold is sort of colour-coded, I suppose. It's got a red border. These red ones are our crown jewels. Ooh. These are specimens which we call type specimens. If you describe a new species, you have to designate a particular specimen as the type specimen. Oh, I see. This was new to science when this oh, one yes. was filed away here. So what, what do we have? This one was collected in Borneo in the 1950s and is a major timber tree from that part of the world. And this specimen is the kind of reference point, yes. if you like, for anybody ever wanting to know what is meant by the name Diptrocarpus yes. pachyphilis. Yes. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, knowledge is power. These are full of information, these, these cards. But what exactly is the, is, it, well, is the economic importance of this? Of course. I mean, initially, yeah. when people were collecting these mm. things, they were documenting the, the yeah. resources, the riches, the things yes. that could be exploited from different yes. parts of the yes. world. Yes. Um, and Q had a role in that, in that it was a kind of entrepot for information yeah. as well as specimens yes. through the British Empire and beyond. But more recently, these things are important as records of vegetation through time, so that if it's changing, for oh. example, with things like uh, climate change, yeah, yeah. these things actually do represent permanent records. Yes, yes. In the early 19th century, transporting dried specimens was one thing. Transporting valuable live plants was quite another. Here they are. At least 2,000 new species of plant are described as new each year because the world's inventory is incomplete. What the mutiny on the bounty had taught Hooker was that surrendering living quarters to plants was not a good thing. But how else could live plants be safe from salt water while exposed to sunlight? Strangely enough, within this ancient file is a clue to the solution. It's not the, um, the specimens inside, nor the writing, but the blackened state of the paper, the dirt. This is genuine 19th century London smog. And this led a man to uh, contact Hooker with an idea that would eventually change the course of the history of the gardens. Dr Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward was a plant collector living in the east end of London. And he had a problem. The ferns in his garden were being poisoned by ghastly air pollution that was spewing out of countless chimneys across the city. Inside the house, Dr. Ward kept cocoons of moths in sealed glass bottles. And he noticed that fern spores were germinating and growing keenly in the bottoms of those bottles. Dr. Ward ordered a carpenter to make him a glazed wooden case, as airtight as possible. Essentially, a big version of the sealed glass bottle. Oh yes, this uh, appears to be an early case. Take the lid off like this. Ward found that plants grown in such cases did better than plants grown outside in the polluted air. Essentially, he discovered that plants in sealed glass topped cases didn't need to be watered regularly, but 
would survive through transpiration. That is a natural process of water recycling that took place within the case. With fewer plants lost on long sea journeys, Dr. Wall's case turned a trickle of living plants arriving at Kew into a torrent. Now Kew had a reliable method of transporting plants around the world, and it had a network of gardens to transfer them to. But it wasn't until 1857, and a series of events taking place nearly 5,000 miles away, that Kew really got the chance to put its skill to the test. In the 19th century, large parts of the Indian subcontinent were run by the British East India Company. The company relied on an army composed largely of native soldiers to impose British rule on an Indian population of hundreds of millions. All that was about to be challenged. By the 1850s, most Indians wanted rid of the British and rumours of a collapse in British rule were rife. On March 29, 1857, on the parade ground right here in Bharatpur, the first substantial outbreak of mutinous violence took place. Twenty-nine-year-old Mangal Pandey of the 34th Bengal Native Infantry decided to rebel, shooting at a British lieutenant before attacking him with a sword. Pandey was court-martialed found guilty and hanged from this ancient banyan tree that stands next to the old parade ground of Barrett Paul. It wasn't just Pandy that was found guilty. His fellow soldiers were accused of having done little to restrain him while he attacked the British officers and they were stripped of their uniforms and dishonorably disbanded. <laughs> It was a spark that was needed to push the widespread feelings of discontent into open revolt. There were a scattering of similar incidents before civil disobedience turned into a full-scale rebellion. Extraordinary barbarities were committed on both sides. The fighting became bitter as the British sought both to regain control and exact vengeance. Villagers showing sympathy to the rebels were simply obliterated. For the British, this ruthless oppression worked, and by July 1858, they regained control. The incompetent East India Company was deposed from power, and India was ruled directly and formally by the British government. I must say, the circumstances of the mutiny, the brutal and ruthless conduct, really was the worst moment in the history of the British Empire in many respects, and uh, its details remain too depressing, too dark, too alarming to contemplate. It was reckoned that tens of thousands more soldiers and administrators would have to be sent out from Britain to India to keep order and maintain a new regime. Thousands of people who would, for the first time, be exposed to a new deadly terror. Malaria. A solution had to be found. At early the 17th century, explorers were returning from the Andes in South America with tales of people who could fend off fevers with the bark of a local tree. That tree was Cincona, and its bark contained quinine, found to be the first effective treatment for malaria.
the British government was very keen to get its hands on its own supply. And so it asked you to send an expedition to the Andes. One of the collectors was Richard Spruce. Dr. Mark Nesbitt keeps one of Kew's strangest collections. Over 90,000 artifacts from two centuries of plant hunting. A whole range of barks from the 18th century onwards. Seeds as well. Let's see what we've got here. Now here's uh, some of the bark uh, collected in 1860 by Richard Spruce. This is Bruce. Yes, so this Ecuador, is yeah, throughout Africa and Asia. Yeah. As well. cutting from a... Bruce arrived in Ecuador in 1859. He succeeded in raising over 600 plants in the mountains and raft them down river, hampered by the terrain, armed bandits, soldiers, and revolutionaries. But he escaped with all his plants and a hundred thousand seeds. Other parts of the of the plant, and uh, here's some seeds. Ooh. It's utterly amazing, isn't it? I'm holding in my hand seeds collected in the 1860s. Um, that was part really of a whole revolution, in a sense. These revolutionary Sincona seeds were sent out to India and across the empire. They were grown in large plantations to provide enough bark for all the anti-malarial powder that was needed. In guarding the health of its overseas subjects, the British government, through Q, had achieved its aim for the Sincona transfer, securing India for the empire. But suddenly Q found itself under an unprecedented attack. The new government had won the 1868 election on a platform of reducing public expenditure and Q once again was targeted. The minister with a brief to save money was the gloriously named Acton Smee Ayrton. He wanted to remove Q's expensive scientific functions and essentially turn it into a public park. Joseph Hooker, the son of William Hooker and director of Kew since 1865, was outraged and the scientific community was up in arms. Hooker's circle realised that science alone wouldn't sway the politicians. They turned instead to Kew's imperial role. Joseph Hooker appealed directly to the Prime Minister, arguing that Kew was an institution that for 30 years had endeavoured to benefit the colonies. To reinforce his argument, he referred to the success of the Sincona relocation. No other organisation could have pulled it off. Coordinating experienced collectors, botanists and gardeners from across the globe. An achievement that promised health and wealth for generations. Joseph Hooker won the day. Q was saved from certain destruction. Q well, uh, Gardens, please. Great, lovely. Acton Smee Ayrton was removed from his post. And the following year lost his seat in the general election. By the late 1860s, Q, a world-class scientific institution, were sending plant collectors all over the world. Over 8,000 plants were arriving at Kew and being dispatched to various colonies every year. But on the 14th of June, 1876, a consignment arrived at Kew all the way from the Amazon. This would inspire the garden's most successful enterprise. Dr. Mark Nesbitt keeps the remnants of that precious shipment. Ah, oh, here we are. Ooh, amazing. Here it is, part of the extraordinary consignment from the Amazon. It says here, Hevia Brasiliensis, 1876. The seeds of the rubber tree. Hi. 
Christopher Columbus and his party were the first Europeans to glimpse rubber in the late 15th century. Let me show you some of our rubber artifacts oh, down yes, here. Indeed, rubber section. From the earliest days, this strangely elastic, waterproof substance proved an enticing novelty. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, uh, surprising. It's a, a bottle. Uh, do, do, do pick it up. It's a rather lovely thing. Very, so very, a, yes, hard, isn't yes. it? So, so this is said to be the world's uh, oldest dated rubber artifact. Oldest it's dated? A, oh, yes, gosh. Yes. What, what date is it then? So 1817. But uh, this is... Um, it's, it's, it's hard because it's cold, I suppose. In the sun, would it become a little bit more flexible? Or... Well, yes, of course, this is before vulcanization. So what was the process of vulcanization? It was this discovery by Charles Goodyear in 1839. If you heated rubber and sulfur, it completely changed the chemical properties. You can make it as flexible as you liked or as hard as you liked, and it would keep those properties. So having seen a sort of really local product, now we'll look at some things that come from the great Victorian mm -hmm. age of manufacturing rubber, and they made everything. So yeah, have a look Ooh, at this. everything. Right, what can this be? Oh, <laughs> earth, isn't it? Uh, made by Charles Macintosh, so the great pioneer. Oh, Macintosh, as in Macintosh. Yeah, oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. It's a yeah. breast pump. You know, one of the things that rubber was really good for once vulcanization had been developed was medical products. And the Victorians, the great ones, are squeezing things in and out of their bodies. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, uh, you still you take the words from, from my lips. <laughs> so this was a really critical moment in the history of rubber. Vulcanization made it a, a really useful material. Uh, it was the plastic of the 19th century. Before 1876, the entire supply of rubber came directly from the rainforests of Brazil. It was a supply that was erratic and infrequent, as the rubber trees were very hard to find, dotted here and there throughout the forest. Ruthless rubber barons, malaria, parasites, and local tribesmen made tracking through the Amazon dangerous and difficult. Oh. Yes, I'm not very cool. We just found this tree, and I see it's a young tree. It hasn't been cut yet, so I suppose, therefore... Oh, he's cutting it now. Oh, look, my goodness me. It's coming out already, straight away. A tree full of life. Methods of rubber tapping in the late 19th century were very inefficient, often killing the tree soon after. The British government needed a more permanent and reliable supply, and once again turned to Q. Q knew one man prepared to risk his life for the chance of fame and fortune. Henry Wickham was a maverick character, a failed entrepreneur, a man dedicated to self-promotion, a great storyteller and a self-styled explorer of the rainforest. Wickham managed to collect thousands of rubber seeds, but then had to get them all the way back to Q. Wickham knew that previous shipments of rubber seed had died on the long journey to Kew. Speed was of the essence. So he got a steamship to carry the seeds to Britain and a steam engine to carry the seeds to London. When in London, a handsome cab, the fastest vehicle in the city, to get the seeds to Kew. Wickham was offered £10 for each thousand rubber tree seeds he delivered back to Kew. His cases were found to contain no less than 70,000 seeds. Get on. Go, Eds. Get on. In the months following, a second collector, Robert Cross, added a further 1,000 seeds to Q's rubber collection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Behind the scenes, pots covering 300 square feet were planted with the precious seeds. Those that germinated into healthy plants were transferred to Wardian cases and sent overseas. Their destination was Sri Lanka and this place, 
nearly 7,000 miles from Kew, the Botanic Gardens in Singapore. Dr. Kiat Tan is the former head of these gardens. His predecessor from 1888 was Henry Ridley, a botanist and geologist, and the man charged with establishing rubber plantations on behalf of Kew and the government. This photograph shows them Henry Ridley. And what was, what was he actually doing? Actually, he's very proud of the progress he's made in devising this new, new mode of tapping the para rubber tree without killing it. Mm -hmm. So the tree would live for, for decades, basically. Decades, yes. or more than that. So he began with this herringbone method, yes. where he would just pare off some of the bark, severing some of the latex ducts. Yeah. And as the latex starts to flow, this herringbone structure then accumulates. He looks very sort of um, wonderfully well-dressed and rather, 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 rather his wonderful moustache. This is, this is a picture that was posed, do you think? What, what sort of character was he? Well, well let me he... show you one that's posed that's, that adds to the legend of Ridley. Good heavens, the Merlin figure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is dressed as Noah at a fancy dress party. Obviously, oh, it was fancy a, dress. Yes, it was an everyday. <laughs> Indeed, a, a, a larger-than-life character. That's why he was called Matt Ridley. Matt Ridley, well, Rubber Ridley. <laughs> well, Rubber Ridley too, because he was so insistent. He's, he was obsessed. Yes. Once he found that rubber was going to be a major crop, yeah. and uh, major crops, what it's all about yeah. with botanic gardens yeah. in those days, he just pressed upon some of the main tea planters, the coffee planters, yeah. to say, hey, try this new crop, it's going yeah. to be the best thing. So the impact of Ridley and his, and his passion, his campaign for rubber, was tremendous in the region. This is the best success story that Q had. Ridley turned rubber into history-making instrument for this whole region. Through Ridley's efforts, soon rubber was being grown in plantations across Malaya. But what made it profitable beyond anyone's wildest dreams was a brilliant invention in 1888, the inflatable tyre. Rubber demand shot through the roof, prices went sky high, and plantations grew rapidly. By the early part of the 20th century, this region was supplying 50% of the world's rubber, and money was pouring in. Today, almost all the world's natural rubber comes from Asia. Q had masterminded a multi-million pound industry that would underpin the British Empire and transform the lives of millions of people across the world. Which could be the end of the story. But there's a twist in the tale. Now, in the early years of the 21st century, the global search for plants goes on. Today, Q's teams are still collecting seeds from all over the world. Once collectors collected for the glory of the king, then for the profit of the empire. And now, in these very different times, they're concerned with the environment and species extinction. And here, in Kew's Wakehurst Place, a new collection has begun. This bomb-proof bunker designed to stand for a thousand years. It's the first phase of the collection of the seeds of every species of plant on the planet. Dr. Paul Smith is head of Kew's Millennium Seed Bank. I mean, how cold is it in here? 
It's minus 20, but with the wind from the fans, it's minus 40 degrees Celsius. So wow, that is uh, yeah, you can feel it biting, can't you? Biting yeah. through. Now, how long? How long do you, do you can you stay in here when you're working here? 30 minutes maximum. Right. Um, slows your metabolism right down, and uh, you need to be out of here before too long. So, yeah, so it slows down aging, doesn't it? Which is quite handy. It does indeed. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. must spend some time here. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about the, the aims of these cold rooms. There are over 23,000 plant species here, um, over 1.3 billion seeds stored here. By next year, we'll have 10% of all of the world's plant species represented, uh, and by 2020, uh, a quarter, 25%. Uh, absolutely astonishing. This is such an important space. Isn't it? I mean, you can really sort of reseed the world to a degree from this room, you know, if, if something awful happened. But what we try to encourage people to do is not to think of these as a billion seeds, but yeah. to think of them as a billion plants, because yes. that's, that's what they have the potential to be. Good heavens, I mean, absolutely amazing. Well, how will this repository of seeds be used in the future? Well, that depends on, on our need, but the, the key thing here is that if we have the seeds, then we have options for their use. You know, we might want to use one of these species in, in horticulture, or it might be a new food crop. It might be a forage species for, for wild animals and for livestock to eat. It gives us options. So this really is uh, such an important room in terms of Q's function globally. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible, really, isn't it? Well, we see this as, as the World Bank, uh, the World if Bank. you like, yes, World yes. Bank for, for seeds, and it's there for everyone to use. Yes. In these seeds are the answers to problems mankind has not yet begun to encounter. In a time of mass habitat destruction and shifting weather patterns, this is the last ditch safeguard against extinction of all plants for the benefit of the future of mankind and the planet. In 1819, when near death, Sir Joseph Banks came to Kew for what would be his last visit. He came here to see this particular plant, Encephalates altensteinii, one of the first plants brought back here by the first collector, and so a plant that launched Kew to realize Banks' vision of creating a place that would one day changed the world. And as I stand here now, I can't but help to think that the old man would not be displeased to see Q as it celebrates its 250th anniversary.